Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. A look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. The bank was a late addition to the league's platform. The, the initial platform that the Nonpartisan League ran on in 1916 did not mention a state-owned bank. It played no real part in the campaign of 1916 that, that, elected, the, that elected the legislature. Direct democracy and what, what was seen as a exploitation, uh, unfair. The list of grievances is quite a long one, but the two most important ones were it's a captive economy. You, you had to take your grain essentially to the elevator that was in the town nearest you. And the fate of that product was uh, in the hands of people that you didn't know, especially the grain trade, which discounted the quality of grain pretty regularly. And so there was agrarian self-interest in all of this. The other problem that captive economies always have is you know, where is the capital going to come from? That's Mike Jacobs former editor of the Grand Forks, North Dakota Herald, and author-historian of the Bank of North Dakota's centennial publication on the bank's 100th anniversary. Mike is one of our guests today on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown, and I'm your host, Walt McCree, Ellen's colleague and senior advisor to the Public Banking Institute. Mike Jacobs' stories about the founding of America's only publicly owned bank, will be featured here in our upcoming programs through the year as we celebrate and learn more about how this remarkable and important public institution got started 100 years ago and how it has managed to survive challenges, set records, and inspire replication. Mike is a native to North Dakota and was chosen by the bank's president, Eric Hardmeyer, to craft a retrospective on the bank's history, and he's just the one to do it. As editor of The Herald, Mike has seen a lot of significant state history, but he also holds a professional observer advantage of being a newspaper man, a journalist with a wide eye and a fair mind to tell us this fascinating story. For those of you who are public banking enthusiasts, you'll appreciate his insights and recollections. We'll be visiting with him after we hear from Ellen in a few minutes. Also on our program today is Steve Behrman, an author comedian and philosopher who has set forth an interesting and challenging proposition that we want to explore with you, which is that he's proposing a sane world, which, he says, might make you think he's crazy. But the relevance of examining Steve's approach fits in nicely with the sort of evolutionary change that we see underway in the form of new citizen-level action to correct the systems and policies that don't serve the sustainable well-being of our people and our country. The pursuit of publicly owned banks is but one indication of how significantly and systemically this new call for change is manifesting. It also reflects the time 100 years ago that the people of North Dakota had had enough of their economic and political predicament and banded together to take action. We're seeing the very same thing developing now. The economic deprivation that results from a debt-based monetary system and the profiteering focus of institutions and businesses that extract health and wellness from both the people and the planet are now being confronted with new insights and possibilities. The Green New Deal represents one of those things. So it's an exciting time to be alive, made more so by the inexorable deadlines that are appearing on our horizon, that the primary element of our economy, the earth itself, and the heart of our civilization, the people, are imperiled and must act boldly to escape the likely outcomes of these systemic failures. Money, of course, has a great deal to do with all that, and Ellen has been enlightening the discussion with two new articles that have received wide national exposure. 
Both have to do with how we can afford the future that we must pursue. Well, the first one was that on, uh, of course, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was challenged on uh, endorsing MMT, modern monetary theory, and the critics were saying, you're just going to be printing money and will result in hyperinflation, as in Venezuela. So they used Venezuela for the example. Well, Venezuela did not go into hyperinflation. In fact, all the classic cases, Venezuela, Weimar Germany, Zimbabwe, the reason they wound up in hyperinflation was not because the government was issuing money. It was because they had a debt in a foreign currency, and for one reason or another, they were being squeezed, usually by speculators and short sellers who knew that their currency was going down, and so they would you know, short sell it into the market, which would drive the cost of this money that they had to buy in order to pay off their debts. Yeah. Like Venezuela had debts in dollars, so they mm-hmm. had to buy dollars, whatever the cost, in order to pay this debt, and the cost went up and up in their local currency because the speculators were doing that. And also I included in that article the fact that Chavez, who uh, started the Bolivarian Revolution, basically was um, turning the banks into a public banking system. And so it was a banking revolution. And among other things they were trying to suppress, that was one. I just saw that, you know, Haiti is having riots right now. I mean, things are terrible in Haiti. And the reason is they're upset because the cheap oil that Venezuelans were giving to the other Latin American countries in order to have this whole revolution in all of Latin America, they were um, supplementing oil and in those countries and the proceeds were supposed to go to the poor well it turned out that first of all mm. that now they weren't getting the, the supplements because the u.s had cut them off and also the poor were, hadn't been getting them anyway because the politicians were corrupt so that's what they're writing about but what mm. it shows is this whole latin american attempted revolution is a revolution from us of course but from our banking system as well and Gaddafi in Libya was doing exactly the same thing, trying to unite the African countries to form their own currency and their own financial mm-hmm. system and their own water system, etc. So he had these great plans for transforming Africa and making it independent. They're no longer colonies, but they are mm-hmm. economic colonies. They haven't yet really been freed from us. So mm-hmm. the fear is that Maduro and Venezuela is going to go the way of Libya that we're just out to suppress at all costs. But anyway, it's their hyperinflation is not because they were issuing money to build infrastructure or to give a universal basic income or any of those things you might do with QE for the people. So right. then the second article I wrote was about um, the fact that the Fed itself is now backpedaling on its uh, quantitative tightening. When it did quantitative easing, the theory was that they were easing the pressure on the money supply by getting some more money out there. And they did this by buying assets which and using their reserves to buy the assets, which go to the banks. And then the banks were supposed, this is supposed to exp- expand the lending power of the banks. But of course it didn't because in fact, banks are not reserve constrained. I won't try to explain that. But I mean, the, the economic theory was wrong for starters, um, but it was going to the wrong place. What it did, it did inflate asset prices because it helped the rich clients of the banks to get cheap loans, but that wasn't really because of quantitative easing. It was because of ZERP, the zero interest rate policy, where they made it practically free to borrow. So then the idea was once the economy got back on its feet, they would reverse the whole thing and do quantitative tightening and sell their assets back into the economy and raise interest rates again. So they've been doing that, but it's, they've been squeezing, squeezing, you know, it shrinks the money supply. And what's happened is that um, in the fall, there was like the NASDAQ drop by 22%. I mean, there was a big stock market collapse and uh, debt has hit record levels in all categories. So it's, it's not just like one particular type of debt, but, and defaults are, are hitting record levels. So that's quite alarming even to the banks that the defaults are going up. So the Fed has now said that, well, now they're doing patience, which means they're going to wait and see how the economy goes before they start doing any more tightening. And one Fed official said that 
they might go further and, and actually make quantitative easing a permanent part of their policy. Like they'd have two tools now. Instead of just manipulating interest rates, they would now be able to um, manipulate the actual size of the money supply with quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. So that's a dramatic shift, and they're recognizing that they can't back off from quantitative easing. They've got to keep putting more money out there. And many commentators have said that, and they're, you know, they're all alarmed. And, you know, this is terrible. We're going to just keep inflating, inflating, and we're all doomed. But in fact, you do need to put some money out there every year in order to stabilize the money supply because of the way money is created. Money is created as a debt. The banks create the principal, but they don't create the interest. So there is always more money owed back than was created in the original loan. Plus, much of that money that's created does not return to the productive economy where it can be used to pay off debts. It's tucked under mattresses or saved in or invested in all sorts of vehicles that are not in our local economy. So mm-hmm. so the debtors don't have the money to pay back their debts, and what you wind up is with is debt deflation, where they are not taking out the new loans they need in order to increase the money supply, so they'll have the money to pay off the old loans, and then they start defaulting, and then there's they don't have any money, and there's no jobs, and... You know, there's no demand because everybody's in debt and trying to pay down their debts. So what you have to do is get money out there routinely. And the ancients knew this, as Michael Hudson has written many times, that um, in prior civilizations, they routinely had debt jubilees. Every time they had a new emperor or whatever, they would uh, forgive all the debts because they knew that it was the nature of the usury system that it would grow until it overwhelmed the economy unless you just periodically changed the, you know, wiped everything out and started over again like a monopoly game. So that's what we need to do too. We need to forgive the debts, but you can't have the banks just, I mean, you can't just say, all right, all the debts are null and void because that would bankrupt the banks and that would, you know, it's definitely be a stress on the creditor. The creditor is not the emperor like it was in ancient times the creditor now is individuals or in individual companies that would have to bear the brunt of of that so how else can you do it you can do it by getting extra money out there that goes into people's pockets every month or every year whatever in order that they can use to pay off their debts and so that would be a universal basic income. That's the nature of a universal basic income. Or you could do all sorts of other QE for the people, various ways of getting extra money into the local economy so that which would generate jobs, et cetera, so that people can get the money to pay off their debts. And so that was the gist of that. So all of that to say that we're living in a time where there's an enormous uh, turbulence and or need for changes, systemic changes in uh, our relationship to the our money sources and to the access that we need to credit to keep our economy going. And so we have Bank of North Dakota, which did it 100 years ago, and we have the Green New Deal that's emerging now, and the idea that maybe the Federal Reserve can play a, a new part as well. Right. We have not just a need, but actually an opportunity because we've known for, certainly money reformers have known for at least a century what the uh, answer is, but we haven't been able to get, you know, wave a little flag up there and say, over here, look over here. But now (laughs) suddenly somebody's looking, so that's great. That's encouraging, and, uh, you know, we should just probably, uh, you know, take any sort of positive indicator we can to move forward. All right, Ellen. All right. Well, well, thanks for those insights, and we'll uh, be connecting on this and uh, more specifics uh, soon. Okay, cool. <laughs> you can follow Ellen's prolific and impactful writing by visiting her blog at ellenbrown.com. While recording this upcoming interview of Michael Jacobs about the beginnings of the Bank of North Dakota, the 100th anniversary, to the minute, of the signing of the bank's authorization by the North Dakota legislature took place. And so it is that we begin our series of conversations with one of the most informed historians of North Dakota who was asked by the Bank of North Dakota to write an historical recollection of the bank's history. As a result, 
There's a fine new publication out called The Bank of North Dakota, From Surviving to Thriving, The First 100 Years, written by our guest Mike Jacobs, who, as a newspaper man and native of the state, knows a great deal about the subject and also the backstory that makes this history so interesting and helpful. Helpful in the sense that today's movement toward creation of public banks is built upon the BND's struggles, discoveries, and successes. Somehow, this little bank on the prairie is the paragon of efficiency and effectiveness as a banking institution nationwide, and it lights the path forward for other states and cities that are confronted by the limitations and expenses of a private credit regime. But creating the Bank of North Dakota, as you'll hear Mike tell it, was not on the list of items that its founders were trying to achieve. This was a time when the money problem was acute all over the country, and North Dakota itself came into the Union in uh, 1889, which was not quite the crest of the free silver movement, but pretty close. So money issues were uh, front and center in people's uh, concern. The panic of 1873 and its follow-up in 1893 uh, put a lot of pressure on the, on the state, uh, which essentially was a captive economy. All of the growth was dependent on railroads coming to your location, and all of the raw product was shipped out of the state. So this whole movement actually started with an effort to build terminal elevators. There was a deep-seated resentment of the monopoly that the railroads and the grain trade held over the state. So the initial push was for terminal elevators, uh, state-owned terminal elevators. The, the first thought was that they would be built at the lakehead in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, or potentially in the Twin Cities, uh, the, you know, the mill city of Minneapolis. For various reasons, that didn't happen. So activists in the state, particularly in the Society of Equity, uh, began to agitate for more direct action. Again, this was a time, of course, of good government progressives. So uh, the state very early took up uh, direct democracy, initiative and referendum, direct election of senators and the like, uh, women's suffrage, uh, all of those, uh, what we regard uh, now in North Dakota as part of the political environment, uh, began in the north central states, Wisconsin particularly, and North Dakota. And together with the economic frustration that people felt, the national attention to banking issues generally, and then this new notion about direct democracy, combined with a relatively new population, North Dakota had the second highest percentage of foreign-born citizens in 1920 in the country, following only New York. So these were uh, mostly Northern Europeans used to pretty tight social organization, particularly through churches. And uh, so these notions of, of tight organization, both politically and uh, economically, all of that sort of became part of this, this stew. And then along came the thickening agent, the Nonpartisan League, initially promoted by a man named A.C. Townley, who had been an organizer for the Socialist Party. In Eugene Debs, of course, in 1912, achieved the largest popular vote for a socialist candidate in the nation's history. And um, Townley himself was a failed entrepreneur. He had invested heavily in flax growing and, and found himself at the end of the line, essentially, in terms of, of getting his product to market. And so he was himself aggrieved by the, by the system. He also happened to be a, an extraordinary orator, uh, a kind of a charismatic personality, and uh, a very effective political organizer. And so he built the Nonpartisan League, which essentially came to power on the promise of a state-owned mill and elevator. Uh, it wasn't until the League was in power that uh, the idea of a state-owned bank arose. There had been agitation for rural credit banks. That would be something more similar to credit unions and the like, rather than uh, either a strictly state-owned or a strictly privately-owned bank. But once the idea was broached, it pretty quickly gained both credibility and support. And so on February 25th, in 1919, the North Dakota legislature 
passed the Enabling Act, essentially, um, it was more than that. It directed the creation of uh, a state-owned bank that was to open within 90 days. So uh, this is the 100th anniversary of the uh, creation of the Bank of North Dakota. Here we are 100 years later, inspired in many ways by some new voices speaking to some of the same issues. It's interesting that Townley was a great speaker, as was Debs from that time. And then, of course, before that, uh, William Jennings Bryant, all kind of in a monetary way. And Mary Ellen Lease, but uh, she's kind of from, from Kentucky. But if, prior to all of the electronic media that were yes. now consumed, people were inspired to hear these people talk. And as you say, they had a, a certain kind of listening that came from a values and community sense of commitment. Well, and, uh, and, and Townley Townley was, uh, Townley was an artful showman as well. Uh, the gubernatorial candidate, uh, Lynn J. Frazier, became the first North Dakota governor to, to fly in an airplane. My father had a story about going to see, uh, to see Frazier and Townley at Wabak, North Dakota, uh, which is in, in Montreux County in the northwestern corner of the state. And he was actually, uh, he was... Uh, 16, 18 years old, uh, I think he might have been more interested in the airplane that was bringing them than he was in the political message they had. But uh, it, it became a community event, uh, and that happened all, all over the state. Uh, a young graduate student uh, did a thesis on the role of women in the league, and uh, the league uh, actually brought women's suffrage to North Dakota. And women were an important organizing part of the league because they they are the ones who brought people together for community picnics and uh, church suppers and NPL uh, bean feeds and the like. So uh, the the number of voters in North Dakota increased exponentially in the second decade of the 20th century from 1911 to 1920 with the growth in population, but also with with women's suffrage. That wasn't all to the benefit of the league in the, in the long run, but it certainly contributed to the strength of the political organization vis-a-vis other organizations in the state. Was the Society of Equity, which is a name I hadn't heard before, mm-hmm. were, were they involved in the suffrage movement? The Society of Equity had its heyday really in the 1890s and into the early years of the 20th century. So that would be slightly ahead of the progressive era and the sweep of women's suffrage across the country. I don't remember exactly when the suffrage amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution, but it was right around 1920. But my point is that there, was, there is a, moral, a moralistic element to this movement that produced the industrial program that the league presented it was seen as moral it was seen as it was seen as pushing against the greed and avarice of big business uh, which was always portrayed as uh, boodlers and and uh, fat cats and so on and so forth so there's there is a moral element to this that has its roots really in uh, norwegian pietism in north dakota and you talk about movement for direct democracy that north dakota played a leading role in that where was that coming from is there a strong partisan organization that the people didn't feel represented by or was it just a, a, a demand or a need for a variety of new resources U.S. senators were elected by the legislature in those days. And uh, in North Dakota, the the choices were often dictated by a man named Alexander McKenzie, who was the agent of the Northern Pacific Railroad. And, uh, you know, the the folklore is that North, North and South Dakota were admitted separately because Alexander McKinley and, the, and uh, McKenzie and the uh, railroad interests wanted four senators rather than only two. And the, the f- first two senators uh, were uh, pretty much uh, McKenzie's choices. In 1892, uh, the, the legislature got nothing done other than to choose a senator. And that deadlock caused North Dakotans to begin looking for alternatives to uh, electing the senators in the legislature. This was partly pushed by a man named Martin Nelson Johnson, uh, who was uh, elected to the House but had had ambitions to be a senator. And uh, he pushed for a way to elect U.S. senators 
directly. And eventually, uh, through the offices of John Burke, the, the, the governor elected on a progressive prohibitionist platform in 1906, the legislature adopted what was called the Oregon Plan, which created a primary election for senators, and the legislature was required by the uh, plan that, that was adopted to elect the top vote-getter to the U.S. Senate. This was uh, eventually uh, proven to be unconstitutional because, of course, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution at the time said that U.S. senators were elected by the state legislators, legislatures. But in any case, this push to have direct election of, of U.S. senators gained great traction in North Dakota. George Winship, who was the founding publisher of the Grand Forks Herald, became closely identified with with this effort toward popular democracy. And um, uh, Governor Burke took it a, a step further and championed, championed initiation of, uh, of laws, initiated measures, referendum of referrals of legislation, uh, initiated amendments to the Constitution and the like. These reforms made it possible for the, the uh, nonpartisan league to become successful. And it was the Society of Equity and, and the Populist Party and the good government progressives and the, the pietistic moralists who together made, made all of that happen. Eventually, electing Martin N. Johnson to the U.S. Senate in, uh, in 1908, uh, he served very briefly. His ambition had been, had been fulfilled, and he died within uh, six months of, of, uh, of being sworn in. But that, that experience of, of choosing U.S. senators uh, through popular vote was an important, uh, it was an important movement nationwide uh, and, and it eventually was, it was accomplished by a constitutional amendment. But it, it really took fire in North Dakota and, and, and helped to, to make this one of the most progressive states in terms of, of direct election and uh, open government in the country. So you had this, as you've called it, a, a bubbling stew of issues right. uh, that were driving this. And for those of us who are newcomers to this uh, field, even with our few years underneath us, w we often talk about the the drive for nonpartisan league being focused on the bank, but it wasn't not, really not so well. at all. That, that's not the bank was a late addition to the league's platform. The, the initial platform that the Nonpartisan League ran on in 1916 did not mention a state-owned bank. Frazier, Frazier broached the subject in uh, his uh, address to the legislature after, after he was elected governor. So it, it, played, it played no real part in the campaign of 1916 that, that, elected, the, that elected the legislature. And the dynamic that did drive the nonpartisan league was the grievances that uh, the people had accumulated through the various institutions of uh, of, of monetary control uh, and uh, this direct democracy uh, issue. Direct democracy and the and what what was seen as a exploitation, uh, unfair. The the list of grievances is quite a long one, but the the, the two most important ones were. Uh, it's, a, it's a captive economy. It's a captive market. You, you had to take your grain essentially to the elevator that was in the town nearest you. And the, uh, the fate of that, of that product was uh, in the hands of people that you didn't know, uh, especially the grain trade, which, which discounted the quality of grain pretty, pretty regularly. And so there was a, a very there was a kind of, there was an agrarian self interest in all of this. The other problem that that captive economies colonial economies always have is you know, where is the capital going to come from uh, and uh, in uh, north dakota 's case, it was privately owned banks in the in the twin cities that were heavily invested in uh, railroads and uh, uh, grain mills and the like, and so had a had a an important role in in spreading infrastructure across the state uh, through the railroads. Ra the railroad 
the railroad is destiny could be the state's motto <laughs> because if you didn't get a, if you didn't get a railroad uh, to your town site development uh, you had to you had to move the town site so there was a real sense of alienation from the from the uh, economic system uh, a sense that it, that this was a um, almost a colonial backwater and uh, so there was there was an active search for for ways around that uh, one of the problems was that North Dakota actually had far more banks than it than it could actually accommodate, and uh, so small banks have small credit capacity, and that that became a problem as well. So, was that then a driver for Governor Fraser to come up with a state bank idea? You know, I, I don't. I, I doubt that Governor Fraser himself was responsible for the state bank idea. He uh, he had uh, his ambition had been to be a uh, a doctor. When his elder brother died in his mid to late twenties, Fraser went home to the farm in in uh, the northern Red River Valley and uh, really had no particular interest in politics until uh, Bill Lemke, who was his college roommate, uh, who was a money crank and you know was very interested in the pro- in the problems of money he had his own he had his own grievances about the political and and economic system but um, the idea of a state-owned bank uh, is a little you know, where it actually came from uh, in you know, how it how it how it came to be part of the of the league program is a little bit obscure um, a man named Arthur Lesseur who was the uh, the mayor of Minot uh, and an activist in the uh, Socialist Party, and at one point was considered a potential presidential candidate uh, by the Socialist Party, while uh, while Debs was in prison, he's often given given credit for it. Uh, Lesur appears to have been the champion of the idea of a an appointed board to to govern this this series of uh, institutions that would be created, but the intellectuals ideologues, so to speak, in the, in the league, many of them who had been affiliated with the Socialist Party sought advice from uh, other areas. And, and apparently among, among the ideas that was brought forward was the state-owned bank. Lemke is no one to have written the legislation. And as I said earlier, he was a, a money crank. He was, he was all his life interested in money issues and, and, uh, and in banking issues. Uh, in fact, uh, as, a, as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, sponsored a bill to recreate the Bank of the United States. So uh, these ideas probably uh, are a result of his study with uh, progressive ec- uh, economists at the University of North Dakota and at uh, uh, George Washington University, George, Georgetown or George Washington uh, in, mm-hmm. in D.C., where he got his law degree. Mm-hmm. So the intellectual origins of the of the Bank of North Dakota are a little bit in doubt. We do know that Lemke did two things. Well, three things. One, he convinced his college roommate Lynn J. Frazier to be the gubernatorial candidate. He he wrote the legislation creating the bank, and he insisted on control of the bank by elected officials, and that ended up being the governor. Uh, the Attorney General, and the Commissioner of Agriculture and Labor at the time. And, of course, that was another part of this idea, the progressive idea that, that elected officials should be responsible to the people who elected them. The other innovation uh, that the Nonpartisan League brought in was a recall of public officials, uh, which, of course, was, was used against the League in 1921 and resulted in the recall of Lemke, who was Attorney General, uh, Fraser, who was Governor, and John N. Hagen, who was the uh, Commissioner of Agriculture. We've talked a little bit about the, the political environment, the context in which this emerged, and, and you mentioned the word socialism uh, a time or two in the process because, uh, of course, that was native in the northern part of, this, of, the, of the country and emerging elsewhere as well. Was that a term that was used in that day? Was there any uh, magnetism to that notion? Not, uh, not very much. I think... Uh Townley had been employed as a as a socialist party organizer, uh, and it, the socialist party eventually fired him because, of course, the ideology was that a more uh, how do I put this 
Socialist Party organizers were expected to follow a central line, and creating something called the Nonpartisan League was not in the interests of the Socialist Party nationally. And so Townley and a number of others who had been affiliated with the Socialist Party, the, the League did not present itself uh, as a socialist organization. It presented itself as a nonpartisan organization. And of course, that magic word freed it from uh, any real ideology other than that voters got to decide what they wanted. And if they wanted a state bank as a tool, they, they got one. And uh, clearly, that's something that most of the, for lack of a better term, the brain trust in the nonpartisan league wanted, because they, they saw the critical need to have a, a source of capital within the state in order to uh, foster the, the development of the state's resources. And, and, and they did that by requiring public deposits in the public bank. In other words, right. all of the state's money went into the into the bank, and initially, so did all of the money from government subdivisions. That proved yeah. that proved uh, not palatable to uh, many local governments, and was and was eventually, well, not even eventually, but re- relatively quickly abandoned. But the state's deposits, still by law, all go to the Bank of North Dakota. All those that don't have some other designated uh, right. use. That's Mike Jacobs, author of the 100th anniversary publication, The Bank of North Dakota, From Surviving to Thriving, The First 100 Years. It's an excellent and beautiful book that I highly recommend to you. If you'd like to order a copy, you can go to bnd.nd.gov, and you'll find a link for the book on their homepage. Or you can check in with your local bookseller or Amazon. We want to thank Mike and the Bank of North Dakota for supporting our retrospective on the bank's history. And we look forward to our future editions as we dig deeper into how the bank has survived, what it has achieved, how it operates, and where it's heading. To be continued on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. And now a visit with philosopher and comedian Steve Behrman talking about how humanity can get past its current trials. I came up with the idea of functional politics because I watched a series uh, a while back called Interconnected, which was about the the microbiome. Uh, And uh, they were sponsored, uh, they, they highlighted something called functional medicine. And I'll I'll read you a definition of functional medicine. Uh, Functional medicine seeks to identify and address the root causes of disease and views the body as one integrated system, not a collection of independent organs divided up by medical specialties. It treats the whole system, not just the symptoms. And as I read that, I went, oh, my God, Uh, that is exactly what politics, uh, what we call politics, needs to be what we have is a system that is spending so much energy with these two sides fighting one another that there hasn't been uh, an opportunity to gather around the virtues and values that the 90 percent of us who aren't sociopaths have in common and uh, we don't have a platform for that as yet Uh, and so much of the political conversation is drawn into these sides fighting one another. In our little pre-conversation, you mentioned the book that I wrote with cellular biologist Bruce Lipton, Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future and a Way to Get There from Here. And Bruce, as a cellular and evolutionary biologist, um, has determined that the next phase of human evolution is recognizing that we're all cells in a larger superorganism called humanity. And if we look at so much of the current way that we're engaging with one another, both in our country and worldwide, much of our behavior can be seen as autoimmune dysfunction, where there are healthy cells fighting other healthy cells instead of working together for the benefit and betterment of each and all. If we were to regroup and find ways for us to collaborate collectively and have that impact our national governance, then we could save a lot of time and energy 
and focus that on creating a better life for everybody and solving our problems together using the best thinking that comes from the progressive mind and from the conservative mind. It would seem that the reason that we have these separations is that we perceive those values and those positions uh, as being our identity, our personal identity. What you're suggesting is that we should I, perhaps experience ourselves as identities, as part of a whole, as opposed to being fiercely independent. It's very interesting that you mention that because, you know, we have uh, most of the battles that we're having right now are about ideas that are abstractions. Um, identity politics, for example, you know, uh, which really uh, has really created the, this polarity when actually people, regardless of what side they're on, they, they're interested in the same things. I call, I, I call the real interest of the American people the identical issues, not the identity issues. We all want clean air, clean food, clean water, and clean government. But because we get pulled away by what uh, Eric Fogg, the author of a book called Wedged, calls wedge issues, that the two political parties use to um, raise funds for themselves and create distinctions between uh, their camp and the other camp. But as you know, and as probably most of your listeners know, that behind the two-party puppet show duality is really the same American empire, the same monetary system, the same bankers, the same agribusiness, big pharma, military industrial complex, and they generously permit us to have these battles about identity issues and gay marriage and uh, abortion and so on. They will not have a conversation about the Federal Reserve. They will not have a conversation about our foreign policy that really uh, ends up supporting the few against the, the many around the world. They won't have a conversation about real remedies for our environmental uh, newer situation. And, uh, and, and so consequently, um, the American people every two years are forced into making uh, a, a choice for the lesser evil. And, and so I think that uh, the divide and conquer serves those who are already in power and serves to keep the current system in place because of these um, divisive issues. The people of this country haven't really had a chance to have a real conversation. This program's about money, uh, and here we have the haves and the have-nots. The people who have have a personal sort of an identity that they prop up and gild uh, for their own satisfaction, and the people who have not are left out of any prospect of wealth, well-being that would allow our, econ our economy to actually work. So as you point out on your page, you, you talk about uh, Buckminster Fuller, when he has said, you know, that there's only one, he calls it, either, either we will have utopia or oblivion, and that we must design a world uh, and our world systems with no one and no thing left out. Seems to me that's Precisely what you're talking about with the functional politics. Well, you know, Bucky called that the world game. Um, uh, and uh, what we're playing now seems to be the end of the world game because at the current ways that we are organized to uh, spend our time, attention, energy, and resource, we have focused that uh, on essentially being in battle with one another when nature tells us that that's not how things work. It's not survival of the fittest, it's really thrival of the fittingest, that um, those living entities that are most fitting with the environment, that are most, um, in a way, cooperative and collaborative, are the ones that are able to continue. And the ones that put themselves outside the web of life, uh, they are the ones that fall by the wayside. So right now we're at a point where there's seven and a half billion people and we're using an outdated, uh, obsolete, and I would call it obsolethal way of organizing both politically and economically. I'll give you an example that Bruce uses in, uh, in Spontaneous Evolution. Imagine if we were still a hunter-gatherer society 
And every morning, 8 million New Yorkers got up and trudged north to Westchester County to forage for berries. Um, you know, it's, it's absurd to imagine at the level of population that we have right now that this ancient form of organization would, uh, would, could possibly work. And so what we're seeing now is that given that we do have limited physical resources on the planet, and uh, uh, unless we want to completely destroy ourselves, mutually destroy, uh, assured destruction, that there have to be new ways of engaging archaeological research done on, quote-unquote, matriarchal societies. What was concluded about matriarchy was that not that the, the feminine dominated, but rather there was an egalitarian culture where Rianne Eisler calls it the partnership society. And essentially reorganizing ourselves from, from the uh, overarching meme, it's every man for himself, to we're all in this together, or uh, in terms of money, from the rule of gold to the golden rule. Uh, and so this is a, a shift in consciousness, and it takes, um, it takes a lot of metabolizing of past hurts and fears and uh, transgressions and perpetrations, uh, which is why I think we need... Uh, some form of truth and reconciliation both for our country and the world so that we can metabolize these past deeds to uh, uh, be aware of them, acknowledge them, accept them, forgive them, but not forget them, uh, just remember them differently, and move on to different kinds of organization. What I'm proposing with, uh, with functional politics uh, involves two things. One is a new institution that uh, I'm, for, I'm happy to be working with uh, my, my friend and associate, Richard Lang, who wrote a book called Virtual Country. And this is called The National Town Square. And the idea behind The National Town Square, imagine if all 230 million American registered voters had a place that they could weigh in on any issue uh, that was uh, totally transparent, totally verifiable like a bank card that would be an advisory vote so that our uh, our legislators and our um, our government uh, could see uh, in a very verifiable way these are real people they're not bots they're not trolls how the american public uh, views a number of issues and this would be particularly helpful uh, around the issues that neither political party wants to face, like genuine reform of the electoral system, like genuine reform of the monetary system, like finding a way to, um, to shift from money being issued by the Federal Reserve to money being uh, essentially put into circulation you know, by the government as money that's pumped up through the system as a bubble up rather than trickle down. If the American people had an opportunity to, uh, en masse, be exposed to some of these new ideas without having the, uh, the influence of their particular side telling them why it won't work and won't work because they don't, you know, two sides don't want it, the American people would be able to actually independently consider new ideas and instead of filtering those through, uh, those, uh, through the mainstream media, which wants to control the conversation. I don't, I don't imagine that Ellen Brown has had lots and lots and lots of interviews on CNN because the idea is threatening to the power structure as it is. We cannot reform the system from inside the system. Basically, neither of those two parties, uh, first of all, have the interests of the American people at heart, and neither of those two parties, from an ideological standpoint, can actually collaborate to solve problems. So we, the people, <clears throat> uh, we could look at our government as kind of like, a, a, like an uncle, like our Uncle Sam, who has become hopelessly addicted, and we have to check him into a program. But we have to do the intervention um, to, to check our Uncle Sam into a program, and we need the institutions and the vast ways of communicating um, uh, 
independent of mainstream media, independent of government, independent of corporate interests, and that's what the National Town Square will be. So this transformative notion that you're proposing begins at home, begins with the individuals who, uh, who are exercising or holding on to the levers of power and or the opinions of power and want to perpetuate those. And what we have to create is a, is a situation that will nurture, n- nurture a collaborative identity where we realize that we belong to each other and that unless we all participate and benefit, things will not work and will certainly not be sustainable. I really like that I, that idea of a collaborative identity. Um, you know, now of course there are people who feel like, oh my God, this is going to be some kind of a one-world government. We don't want that. What we're really talking about is from the ground up, not from the top down. And when we gather in community voluntarily, what we find is that the more connected we are, the more free we are, because we're freed up. We freed our energy from having to battle battles that don't need to be fought. Uh, We freed our energy to produce, to create, to make things better for people in our communities, to educate our children better, to ensure health in our soil, all of these things. And unfortunately, the current power structure benefits from many of the things that are detrimental to the planet and detrimental to our our individual well-being. So part of this next level of organization Because we have the ability to, I don't know how many, there's probably close to six or seven billion cell phones on the planet. Almost everybody has a cell phone. Any individual now can communicate and be on the World Wide Web instantaneously. And anyone in this country using using, uh, the National Town Square app that's being developed will be able to voice their vote on any issue. Uh, there will be uh, education that uh, will be uh, fact-based and balanced, uh, vetted by both sides or all sides, so that people could become better educated and not in the silo that they've been accustomed to and begin to step outside of that. It's been shown time and time again that ordinary people put together and given certain tools and ground rules for conversation and collaboration can come up with better solutions than groups of experts because they're not attached to this body of knowledge that may be very one-sided or may not be seeing everything. Um, There have been um, wisdom councils, um, citizen deliberation groups that have come up with policies that have been extraordinary. So what would happen if through the National Town Square and the adjunct ecosystem for civic engagement, that people all across the country could be involved in these conversation threads and be able to take a legislative idea, particularly around, legis- around reform of elections, transparency in governance, money and politics, which about 90% of us agree on, and then could take the best ideas and vet those ideas and then run them up the pop chart And instead of legislation being presented as it is now by uh, corporate entities and other large interest groups, that the findings of the national town square and citizens across the country, that ends up being presented as legislation. And we'll know that it will have 80 or 90 percent agreement and it will take the the legislators who are now indebted to various interests who determine their election by how much money they donate and will instead be indebted to the voters in their district and the people in this country to choose governance that rises above special interests. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a rare moment. Uh, I think we're fortunate, we're blessed, we're challenged. Uh, to to live at a time when this uh, the electronic uh, capabilities to connect us are there, but also at a time when the challenges are so steep and the systems are so uh, divisive, destructive, ext- exploitive, extractive, um, that the people 
are, are going to be the ones to make this change. I, I love the phrase that you, you have so many great phrases, Steve, but where you say, well, our system doesn't need reform, it needs reformulation. And that's brilliant. I, it's, so, it's absolutely true. And if, we, if we're looking at reformulating our current system, and if we're looking at people as being the cutting edge, as the agents for change, in your term, spontaneous evolution, this is an evolutionary process we're in. How does spontaneous evolution occur within the grassroots? Well, you know, uh, what we say in, in our book is that um, uh, crisis precipitates evolution. And if we look at the world around us, the chances of precipitation are 100%. So what, what, that would, what that would indicate, uh, if we really look at the markers, you know, people who are involved in the climate movement and all of that, many people have just given up. They're, they're going, you know what, looking at the numbers, it looks like we can't get there from here. Uh, we need a miracle. Now, it turns out that there is a template for miracles. And the template for miracles on the individual level is something called spontaneous remission. In almost all of the cases was that they all had what he called a change of story. Something in their life, something they were telling themselves, uh, some part of their life that had become unbearable that led to this um, crisis, this health crisis. In making that change, in changing that story, somehow the field changed to such an extent that the physical body actually manifested healing. So in our book, Bruce and I say that uh, if we want a spontaneous remission, we need a spontaneous remissioning. We need to shift our mission from um, dominate or be dominated, which is how the world has been ruled you know, since the beginning of so-called civilization, to we're all cells in the same body. Our thanks to Steve Behrman for sharing those insights from his Functional Politics program. Well, that's it for this edition of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Our thanks to our guests, our sponsor, Public Banking Associates, and to you for listening. Be sure to check out Ellen's latest writings on the economy and the changing world of money by visiting ellenbrown.com. And for more information on public banking, visit publicbankinginstitute.org. For information on how local and state government leaders can obtain professional insight and counsel about public banks from key national experts, visit publicbankingassociates.com. I'm Walt McCree. See you next time on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown.